the Parallel Plate Waveguide. In this lecture, we're going to take the analysis setup equations from the previous lecture and apply them to a parallel plate waveguide. So we will do a TEM analysis, a TM analysis, a TE analysis, and draw a bunch of conclusions. So what is a parallel plate waveguide? And maybe why are we analyzing it? So a parallel plate waveguide really is a slab waveguide, although for some calculations we'll do, we'll pretend that there's some width W to the line. But it's two sheets of metal, and there could be any kind of dielectric or material between those plates. We're going to assume that what's between the plates is homogeneous. This is a wonderful waveguide to start with because it's the easiest to analyze and most of the concepts of about, about waveguides and of analyzing them are involved with the parallel plate waveguide. This is also the geometry that we're going to proceed with. We always let the propagation be in the Z direction. That means the parallel plate waveguide, the cross section of it will be in the XY plane. We'll let the separation between the plates be written as D and there'll be some material between the plates characterized by a permeability and permittivity. Let's start with TEM analysis. It supports a TEM mode because it is a transmission line and has a homogeneous fill. So for TEM analysis, remember this came down to solving Laplace's equation. So we will analyze this in Cartesian coordinates because that is consistent, most consistent, with our parallel plate waveguide. So the Laplacian, if we expand that, is written as three partial derivatives of the electric potential V, all set equal to zero. However, the parallel plate waveguide is uniform in the X and Y directions. It's only that vertical Y direction where we could be on or off the plate. So that means any derivatives in the X or Z directions has to be zero. So we cross them off and we are left with a single derivative in the Y direction. So another aspect of this, we would like to analyze this as a one dimensional problem as a slab waveguide. So that means if there is any width W to this, we're ignoring any fringing fields that may be outside of this. We're just going to pretend as if all the fields are completely straight from one plate to the other. And that's a great approximation in the middle. So if we have a wide parallel plate waveguide, it's a very good approximation. If we happen to have a case where this is very narrow, what we're about to do is not a good analysis. And in fact, we'd have to go do a more complicated analysis of this. Since this reduces to just one dimension, we're going to ignore the fringing field, pretend the field is uniform between the plates. There's only one independent variable left, and so our partial derivative becomes an ordinary derivative, and that's gonna make this very easy to solve. So our governing equation is just now the second order derivative of V in the Y direction equals zero. That is a one dimensional Laplacian. So looking at our solution, we're really just obtaining a solution between the plates. Yes, there is an electric potential outside of the plates, but that's not what we're analyzing. We're looking at this as just a, a uh, slab waveguide, and we're only interested in what's going on between the plates. So our solution is restricted there. Before we can solve it, we need boundary conditions. So that is, what is the electric potential on the top plate and the bottom plate? For this, we will apply a voltage V0. If we let the bottom plate just be ground, for example, then we can set our electric potential at Z equals zero to zero, and the electric potential at Z equals D, so a distance D above the ground, now we're at the top plate, to V0. So we have exactly V naught between the plates. Another perfectly valid thing I could do, I could set this plate to minus V naught over two, 
and the top plate to positive V naught over two. The only thing that will really matter is that the difference between these two should be V naught. But what I have written here seems easy enough to proceed with. So here we are. Here is our differential equation. It's the first order Laplacian. Here's where we're solving it, and here's our boundary conditions. In fact, we could hand this off to a mathematician, not even tell them what all this stuff means, and that person could solve this for us and give us the general solution. In this case, it's very easy. We integrate twice to get the general solution. So we have a second order derivative equal to zero. So when we integrate this equation, we end up with a first order derivative on the left and a constant a on the right. If we integrate the second equation again, we get the just the electric potential, no derivative of it, equals our constant from before times y plus a new constant. So that is our general solution. Now to find a and b, we have to apply our boundary conditions, and that's next. So there's our general solution. We wrote it there for convenience. Let's apply the boundary condition at the bottom plate. So our electric potential at the bottom plate equals zero. So when we set y equal to zero, we'll have a times zero plus b equals zero. So this term disappears and we just end up with b equals zero. So we've already found that this second constant that arose when we solved our differential equation is zero. It's not there. Now let's find a. We find a by applying the boundary condition at the top plate by setting y equal to d. So we'll go up here and we'll set y equal to d. So a times d plus b has to equal v naught. However, we found in the when we applied the previous boundary, this is zero. So we just have a times d equals v naught, and we solve for a. A is simply v naught over d. And so we found A, and now we can write the general solution for our parallel plate. And there it is. However, we're not finished. Just knowing the electric potential between the plates really doesn't tell us much. We want to learn more about the waveguide. What does the mode look like? What is its impedance? And so on. So we're not finished. So in order to learn more about the waveguide, let's calculate the electric field. Well, remember from electrostatics, the electric field is related to the electric potential through the gradient. So electric field intensity is the negative gradient of the electric potential. Well, we have this expression for the electric potential now, so we can calculate its gradient. And we go through all this math, and we end up here. And so we only have a component in the y direction. So the electric field is pointing straight from one plate to another. It's perfectly vertical. And it's uniform. Notice there's no y in here. So that means the electric field in the y direction does not vary. It's a constant electric field. And the negative sign here shows that the electric field is going from the top plate to the bottom plate. And that's consistent with how we define electric fields, always going from positive to negative charge. Or in this case, from positive potential to, or from higher potential to lower potential. So everything's consistent with what we already know. So here's how we might write our solution. So this came from an electrostatic analysis. So right now, this is a completely static electric field. What about the wave nature of it? We ignored that by analyzing this as an electrostatics problem. Well, that's pretty easy to do. To look at this as a wave solution, we simply take our electrostatic solution and tack on this e to the minus j beta z. What we found doing the electrostatic analysis was just that amplitude term. So now we have our wave solution for the electric field. We want to learn about our waveguide, so we need to keep solving for things. The next logical thing to solve for is the magnetic field. And so essentially we substitute this answer into Faraday's law. Uh, to simplify that down a little bit, we can go through impedance, too. We can use this expression when we talked about waves to get the magnetic field. So we plug in our expression for E, we turn our crank, 
and we end up here. And what we see is that the magnetic field is pointing in the same direction. It is a constant. It's in the x direction. So this is now parallel to our parallel plate waveguide. And it has the same e to the minus j beta z. Now that we now now that we know both the electric and magnetic fields, we're in a good position to learn more about this. Since we know the fields, now we can start learning things. So let's calculate an expression for the impedance of our TEM wave. So the impedance is defined as our applied voltage divided by the current. We haven't talked about current yet, but in fact, we sort of know the current because we've calculated the magnetic field. And from our discussions in magnetostatics, we understand if we know the magnetic field, we can figure out what the current is. Remember, if we have a sheet of current, this K is our surface current density in units of amps per meter. If we cross product with the surface normal and divide by two, that gives us the magnetic field. And for us, the surface normal is in the negative Y direction. Now we actually have two plates. We have a top plate and a bottom plate. So the magnetic field due to two plates is twice what we just talked about. So it's K cross N. Well, the current is lumped into this K term. So we would like to solve this equation for K. And when we do that, here's what we get. K is H cross the AY, the unit vector in the Y direction. Now I've dropped this two sheet subscript here but this is the magnetic field due to both sheets. Just for simplicity, I've, I've dropped that. Okay, let's keep going. The total current we can find by integrating the surface current density across the plate. So we're going to integrate the surface current density dot product in the direction the wave is propagating, and we're gonna integrate that over the width of our plate. Well, we have an expression for K in terms of the magnetic field now. We can plug that in. And now we can look at AY dot AZ and our integration. We just integrate H sub X over the width of our plate. From our electromagnetic analysis, if we set Z equal to zero, we know what the magnetic field is. That's V naught over A to D. Now we can take this expression, plug that into this integral, and get an expression for total current, which is just the width of the guide over the separation of the plates times the applied voltage divided by the impedance of the material between the plates. Now we're in a position to finally calculate an expression for impedance. It's V naught, which is the applied voltage, over I. We just got an expression for I. We plug that in here, our V naughts cancel, and we end up with this nice, pretty expression. And a good check to make sure we're right is that current and voltage does not occur in there. So our impedance of our line should not depend on voltage or current for a linear system. So now we have an expression for the impedance of a parallel plate waveguide. And I'll warn you ahead of time, this is really only valid if our parallel plate is very wide. When it becomes narrower, that approximation breaks down and it's really not good to use. It'll get you within an order of magnitude of what the actual impedance would be, uh, but it is much more accurate for very, very wide parallel plates. Let's think about the propagation constant. Where did this arise everywhere? Well, it didn't. And so we have to look deeper to figure this out. Remember in a previous lecture, we found that for the TEM modes, our phase constant and wave number were the same. And then this led to the discussion of the cutoff frequency being zero. But what it tells us is that the speed of the wave is real in the transmission line is really the same as the speed of a wave if it were just in the dielectric in the plate. So TEM waves propagate about the same speed as a, as a plane wave would. Well, that lets us set our phase constant equal to omega times square root of mu epsilon because we used to write k equals omega times square root of mu epsilon. So that must be our phase constant for the TEM wave. Maybe we can even find equations now for the distributed inductance and capacitance of this line. So a couple slides ago, we derived an expression for the characteristic impedance of our parallel plate transmission line. 
If we look at this as a parallel plate capacitor, we could borrow what we've done from electrostatics and write our capacitance. Let's think about the inductance now. Okay, so this is the equation we derived a couple slides ago. We also know from our discussion of transmission lines that the characteristic impedance is the square root of distributed inductance over distributed capacitance. Well, L is what we're trying to find, but we have an expression now for our distributed capacitance. It's what we found in electrostatics, so we can plug that in here. Now what we'll do is we will set the expression we derived in this set of slides, set that equal to this square root, and that lets us derive an expression for the distributed inductance. Let's do an example. So here's a parallel plate transmission line, two millimeters wide, half millimeter separation between plates, and the dielectric constant or the relative permittivity between the plates is 2.3. So my question might be, what is the characteristic impedance of this line? We could also look at this as a design. What width could we choose to make the line exactly 50 ohms? Okay, first thing is impedance. Here's our equation for impedance. We have the separation between plates and the width. What we don't have is the impedance of the medium between the plates. So we'll have to calculate that and then go back to this equation. So the impedance is the free space impedance times the square root of relative permeability divided by relative permittivity. This is something we talked about in electrostatics. So free space impedance around 377 ohms. We weren't given anything about a permeability, so we just assume that that's one. We were given the relative permittivity or dielectric constant of 2.3. And so if we do the calculations, we get about 250 ohm impedance for the material between the plates. Now we can go back into our equation for impedance, plug in all the numbers we have, and we come away with 62.1 ohms. Now for the second part of this example, we would like to adjust the width away from this two millimeters so that we get a 50 ohm line. This is very typical for how we would design a transmission line. Normally things like thickness and permittivity are fixed and the degree of freedom that we most often use is the width of the transmission line. So we'll take our expression for the impedance of the line and solve it for W, because now the impedance is the known thing, 50 ohms. We want to plug that in and figure out what the width of the line needs to be. So we plug in our numbers, and to get a 50 ohm line, we need the width of that line to be around 2.5 millimeters. Here's a visualization of the TEM mode in a parallel plate waveguide. So the blue lines here, the blue arrows, are showing the electric field vector, and the red is showing the magnetic field. So notice the electric field is pointing straight from plate to plate, although it does oscillate. It goes up and down because it's a wave phenomenon. And as the wave accumulates phase, it's going in and out. We're looking at just the real part of the wave, if you will. And the magnetic field is always pointing in the X direction, and it is also oscillating. But notice that the amplitude from plate to plate is completely uniform from plate to plate. It's not like there's a bright spot in the middle or it's some kind of weird wavy looking pattern. It's a completely uniform field between the plates. And that is our TEM mode. So here's a summary of what we did. We calculated the fields and here's what the fields look like between the plates. We got our phase constant. Since it's the TEM mode, there is no cutoff frequency. That, so the the TEM mode goes all the way down to DC. We even now have an expression for the characteristic impedance. So TEM mode has no cutoff frequency. And the last little note here is not something we've talked about yet, but when we analyze the TM modes, what we'll find is the zero order TM mode is the TEM mode. And what I said now may not make any sense, but it will make sense when we get to that. Let's analyze the TE modes 
in this parallel plate waveguide. Here's our starting point. We are doing TE analysis. That's transverse electric. So the Z component of the electric field is equal to zero. That means we're solving our differential equation for H naught Z. We had a Laplacian here. I expanded that in the Cartesian coordinates. So that's where the second order X and Y derivatives come from. And remind us this KC is called the cutoff wave number and it was K squared minus beta squared. This is very soon going to have meaning for us. And also to remind us, Here's the equations for calculating the other field components once we have solved H naught Z. And we will make use of these. So let's look at our parallel plate waveguide. It is perfectly uniform in the X direction. We're also letting our mode propagate in the Z direction. So there's not even any phase being accumulated in the X direction. So literally nothing is happening in the x direction for our parallel plate. That means any derivative in the x direction has to be zero. Well, this is going to simplify our differential equation. We have an x derivative here. It's a second order derivative, but we cross it off. And so we're only left with one derivative in the y direction. And in fact, there's only one independent variable left. So our partial derivative has become an ordinary derivative, and it's a much simpler differential equation. So we could hand off this differential equation to a mathematician, not even tell them what these different terms mean, and they can return the general solution to this equation. And there's really two ways you can write this. You can write this in terms of complex exponentials, or you can write it in terms of sines and cosines. So most people, when they're analyzing this waveguide, go with the sine and cosine solution. We have two constants to find, A and B, and those are found by applying boundary conditions. Now, our boundary condition, when we have metal plates, those are perfect electric conductors, the boundary condition is that the electric field, the tangential component, uh, anyway, is zero at the plates. Well, here's a problem. We just found a magnetic field. We right now know H naught Z. And there really is no boundary condition for magnetic fields at a metal plate. We need to apply the boundary condition in terms of the electric field. So in fact, what we're going to have to do is go back and grab one of those equations for calculating the other field components from H naught Z plug our general solution into that to get a general solution for the electric field, then apply the boundary condition. So uh, for TE analysis, it's a bit more involved. So here's the expression we have for calculating E naught X from H naught Z. We will plug in the expression for our general solution, take the derivative, and here we have the general solution for the electric field. Notice we grabbed E naught X instead of E naught Y. E naught Y is not tangential to those plates. It's normal to them. So uh, we can't apply the easy boundary condition of the tangential component being zero. So that's why we calculated E naught X. Okay, so now we have the general solution for E naught X. Now we can apply the boundary conditions. So our first boundary condition happens at y equals zero, and our electric field has to go to zero at this bottom plate. So we take our general solution and set y equal to zero. So that means the arguments of both sine and cosine are zero. Well, sine of zero is zero, so this drops off, and we're left with a cosine of zero. Cosine of zero is just one. So inside the square brackets, we're just left with a. Well, none of these constants in front of A can equal zero. So the only thing that can make this expression equal zero is if A equals zero. So we found our first constant, A. It is zero. That means we'll find B by applying the boundary condition at the top plate. So at the top plate, Y equals D. So we will plug in D for Y in our general solution. Notice that first term we've already dropped because we know that A equals zero. So it's not there anymore. So if we choose B equal to zero, 
that means our entire general solution is all zero. Well, that's the trivial solution, and that's not what we're trying to find here. So something else must be making this expression equal zero. Well, j omega mu over kc, none of these can be zero, so that can't be doing it. So what's left then is this sine term. It has to be the sine term that is somehow forcing this to be zero. So we set the sine term equal to zero. Well, this sine function can only go to zero when kc times d is an integer multiple of pi. Sine of an integer multiple of pi is zero. So that means our kc times d has to be an integer multiple of pi, where m is this integer, and it's one, two, three, four, all the way up to infinity. There's a, a few interesting points we need to make here. First, notice I'm not including m equals zero. It turns out this is not a valid solution because it turns out it forces all of the electric fields to zero, and that's not a meaningful answer. The other interesting thing is that m goes all the way up to infinity. And way back when we first started talking about waveguides, I mentioned there's an infinite number of modes, and that's where this happens. m can be any integer all the way up to infinity, and we can always keep going to higher and higher frequencies to find more modes. And the last point I'll make is that m is discrete. I can't choose a value of 1.7, for example. That's not a valid solution. It's an integer. So the solutions to our waveguide are discrete. The modes propagating in the waveguide are discrete. We will have a first order mode, a second order mode, an M, or third order mode, and so on. And M will be our order of that mode. So we solve this expression for our cutoff wave number and we get M pi over D, again, where M is any integer other than zero. And we're going to use this expression on our next slide. So this was a really important slide because this was the origin of having discrete modes in a waveguide, having a first mode, second mode, third mode, and so on. Remember our definition of the cutoff wave number. It was k squared minus beta squared. If we solve this for our phase constant, because that's what we want to find here, we get square root of k squared minus kc squared. Well, on the previous slide, we derived an expression for kc. Let's go ahead and plug that in. Now we have an expression for our phase constant, but there's this m here. We have a bunch of different modes. And in fact, when we plug in different values of m, we get different values of beta. So each mode in the waveguide has its own unique phase constant. That means each mode propagates at a different speed. That's really a discussion for another class, but different modes propagating at different speeds can actually lead to problems and things like intersymbol interference and it limits your bandwidth and other, other nasty things. We want to remember that this phase constant changes for each mode. So when we write this, we're gonna write beta with a subscript M to remind us that's the phase constant for the nth mode. I went ahead and plotted some representative values of a phase constant beta for a parallel plate waveguide. And so for different wave numbers k, I'm plotting this phase constant. Uh, the red line is the m equals 1 mode. Remember, there's no m equals 0 mode. And I'm plotting the phase constant for different modes. And I can keep going, 8, 9, 10, etc. And so we notice that the phase constant changes with this wave number. Uh, more information, more meaning, and some interesting things will come out of this in later slides. So here's our final solution. We started with a differential equation. We got a general solution. Yes, we had to then calculate an electric field in order to apply the boundary conditions in order to get A and B, but we did eventually find an A and a B. Well, in fact, I should mention we didn't find a B. We did find that there's discrete choices for KC that satisfy our boundary conditions. So we didn't find B, so we have to keep B. And B just becomes the amplitude of the nth mode. And so our final solution, we tack on the E to the minus J beta Z,
And here is our final solution for the magnetic field. Now, from that, we can substitute this expression back into our equations to calculate all of the other field components. So here is the total solution for the TE modes in a parallel plate waveguide. Let's look at this thing again. Why not the zero order mode? Let's go to the previous slide, take all of those expressions for the field and plug in zero for M. Well, what we see is that all of the electric fields are zero. So the electric field is entirely zero. Yes, we have a magnetic field term, but for a propagating wave thing, that doesn't really make sense. So this clearly is not a physical mode. And so there is no TE zero mode in a parallel plate waveguide. Let's think more about this cutoff condition. This is where this KC term is going to have meaning. So we derived an expression for our phase constant. It was the square root of K squared minus KC squared. So and really, in order for this to make sense, we need K squared to be larger than KC squared. That way we get a positive number under our square root, so we get a real value for beta. And that is why this is called the cutoff wave number, because if this becomes larger than K, this becomes a negative number, our beta becomes imaginary, and that really corresponds to a cutoff mode. It's not a mode supported by that waveguide, and all this is determined through that cutoff wave number. I'll also mention, just because the mode is cut off does not mean it does not propagate through a waveguide. In fact, it does. It's just that it decays very quickly. So with that said, let's derive an expression for the cutoff frequency. So our cutoff wave number is our cutoff angular frequency times square root of mu epsilon. And we have an expression for our KC. It's m pi over d. Our angular frequency is 2 pi times the ordinary frequency. So the ordinary frequency, that's the one that's in hertz, kilohertz, megahertz. Now we can solve for this cutoff frequency. And we can put it in terms of m, d, mu, and epsilon, or we can also put it in terms of the cutoff wave number. Yeah, this is probably the more useful equation, but you have both. And so we can use that to calculate the cutoff frequency for any of the TE modes just by plugging in different integers for M. And each mode will have a cutoff frequency. And at frequencies below the cutoff, that mode is not supported by the waveguide and will decay very quickly if we tried to excite the waveguide with that mode. Above that frequency, the mode exists. I also mentioned something else that's a little bit of an aside topic, but right at the cutoff, boy, things get really squirrely with that mode. Um, and we tend not to want to operate a guided mode near its cutoff because really crazy things happen there. And we tend to operate at much higher frequencies. Wish I could go more into that because it's an interesting story, but I can't go into that here. Let's think about the characteristic impedance. So we define the characteristic impedance as the amplitude of the electric field over the amplitude of the magnetic field. And we have two different choices that we could do, the X and Y components or, or Y and X. So we derived expressions a few slides ago for E naught X and E naught Y. So we simply just plug them in. We start canceling and simplifying, and we end up with an expression to calculate the characteristic impedance of the TE modes. Now that we've done the analysis, now we actually know this phase constant. So we're in a position to calculate the characteristic impedance. Another useful parameter is the effective refractive index of the, of the mode. And the meaning of this is if we have a guided mode, it's interacting with the waveguide and traveling slower than it would if it were a plane wave traveling in whatever the material is inside the waveguide. And so we give it an effective refractive index to give it that factor by which it slows down relative to uh, a wave in outer space. 
So our phase constant we can write as the free space wave number times this effective refractive index. But we have it an expression for our beta. We derived that a couple slides ago. So that gives us an expression for the effective refractive index. We divide both sides by K naught. And when we do that, that's where we end up. So notice M is here. So that means each guided mode will have a different effective refractive index. That means each guided mode travels at a different speed, which can lead to problems or other interesting things. And so it also depends on these other parameters, the refractive index of the material between the plates, the separation between the plates. Another thing to think about, under the square root, we have one minus something. That's making this argument less than one. So the effective refractive index is becoming less than the refractive index of the material between the plate. So think about this. What if the material between the plates is air? Are we creating something between those plates that actually travels faster than the speed of light? Let's do some calculations. Let's plot the effective refractive index for various modes, first, second, third order modes. Notice the effective refractive index is always less than one. So these modes in this parallel plate waveguide seem to be traveling faster than the speed of light. How do we feel about that? So here's a visualization of the first TE mode. Now this is not uniform because remember the amplitude profile had a sine cosine term in there. And we're seeing that. We're seeing a single hump of a sine with its peak right in the middle. And so one thing we'll notice when we're mentioning orders of the modes, whatever number here is how many humps we see between the plates. So we see a minimum to a maximum to a minimum. So one hump. That's clearly a first order mode. And so our eyes would see a bright spot in the middle of the plates. Let's look at the second order mode. So here we have two humps. It starts at zero, it goes to a bright spot, it goes to zero again, back up to a bright spot and back to zero. So our eyes would see two bright spots between these plates. That's the TE2 mode. And of course, this would go. If we looked at the TE7 mode, we'd see seven bright spots between those plates. Third order mode, we're seeing three bright spots. It's going to be hard from how many arrows I'm showing here to see anything higher than this. So we'll stop at this third order mode, but there's definitely three bright spots here. So here's a summary of what we've done. We've calculated the fields for all of the TE modes. We've calculated phase constants. We calculated cutoff frequency. And we calculated characteristic impedance. And we haven't done the TM analysis yet, but I'm foreshadowing that we're actually going to get the same equation for cutoff frequency. So that's nice because we can calculate cutoff frequencies for both at the same time. We also saw that the TE0 mode does not exist. That makes the TE1 the lowest order TE mode in the waveguide. And the lowest order mode is always the most important mode because if we try to send power down the waveguide, most of the power ends up in the lower order mode. So that tends to be the one we work with the most. And a lot of times we only want a single mode to propagate in that guide. And why is that? That's because the modes travel at a different speed so if we launch, let's say, the edge of a square wave and we excite both modes, if they travel at different speeds, that nice crisp square edge is going to blur and spread and, and cause bad problems. So very often we operate waveguides as single mode. We are going to repeat everything we just did but now for tm modes and what you'll see is everything here is almost exactly the same and in fact when we apply the boundary conditions it's easier for the tm mode so one might ask why i didn't start off with tm you know it just it was the mood i was in so here's our starting point we are doing 
TM analysis, that is transverse magnetic. That means the Z component of H is zero. That means we are solving our differential equation for the electric field. And what was the Laplacian here, we're now writing as, uh, we expanded that into Cartesian coordinates, so we're looking at it as two partial derivatives with respect to X and Y. And to remind us, once we find a solution for E naught Z, we will plug that solution into these equations to find all of the other components. Looking at our parallel plate, just like we did for the T analysis, we see that literally nothing happens in the X direction. The parallel plate does not change in the X direction. The mode does not accumulate phase in the X direction. Literally nothing happens. So any derivative in the X direction has to be zero. So if we go back to our differential equation, we can cross off that X derivative. Now we only have one independent variable left. So our partial derivative becomes an ordinary derivative. So this is the differential equation we'll solve to calculate the modes in a parallel plate waveguide for TM modes. So here's our differential equation. We could hand this off to a mathematician, not even tell them what the terms mean, and they could solve that for us and come up with our general solution. Just like I mentioned for the TE modes, we could choose our solution in terms of complex exponentials or in terms of sines and cosines. It's more conventional to go with sines and cosines here. And we have two constants, A and B. And we find these constants by applying the boundary conditions. Now something really fortunate is happening to us. We have our solution already in terms of the electric field. The Z component is tangential to interfaces, so we can just apply our boundary conditions directly to our solution. Now remember for the TE modes, we had a magnetic field solution. We had to then calculate the electric field solution in order to find those constants A and B. We don't have to do that here. We just apply our solution. So we look at the bottom plate. We set zero in for Y. Our sine term goes to zero, so we're just left with B cosine zero. Cosine zero is one, so we just end up with B. So B equals zero. Now we need to find A. So we will apply our boundary condition at the top plate. So at the top plate, we set in y equals d. Remember the, this b term, b was zero, so that's not even appearing here. We just have the, our a term times a sign. This has to equal zero. Well, if we choose a equal to zero, then that sets our entire solution to zero, and that doesn't make any sense. So it, it's not a that's forcing this to zero. It's the sign term that has to force this to zero. So the only way the sine term can be zero is if its argument is an integer multiple of pi. So this kc times d has to be an integer multiple of pi. And we're going zero, one, two, three. Notice there's a zero here. Uh, it'll turn out we're allowed to have a zero now. And uh, later on, we'll justify why that is. So we solve this expression for kc and we get an expression m pi over d for our cutoff wave number. Let's look at our phase constant. So we had our original definition of our cutoff wave number as k squared minus beta squared. We solve this for the phase constant beta. We have the square root of the difference of two things. On the last slide, we had an expression for kc. We can plug that in and we get an expression for beta. Again, we have this m, which is integers, and so what we'll do is we'll write beta with this subscript m to remind us that the phase constant is actually different depending on which mode we're talking about. And remind us again, for the TM modes, zero is allowed because it does not force all of the fields to become zero, and we'll prove that in a little bit. So we have a TM0 mode here. It'll turn out when we prove this that that actually is the TEM mode. 
So here's our final solution. So we had a differential equation. We had a general solution. We found that B is zero. So this entire term disappeared. We only have the sine term. But since it was the sine term that was zero and A wasn't, A has to stay in this equation. So that just becomes the amplitude of our nth order mode. So here is the final solution for the electric field and we tacked on this e to the minus j beta z. Now we can take that solution, plug it back into our equations to calculate all of the remaining field components and this is where we end up. Now let's talk about this TM0 mode. Does it exist? Well, we go to those field expressions we had on the previous slide. We set in M equals to zero. And what we see is we do have a magnetic field. We do have an electric field. So this is a valid solution. And it also turns out this is consistent with our TEM mode. This was much harder to derive. I might argue it's more rigorous. It was harder to derive. Uh, but it's our TEM mode. So TM0 is the TEM mode. Let's look at cutoff conditions. So our phase constant is the square root of the difference of two things. To be a guided mode, this needs to be a positive number. So this k squared has to be greater than kc squared, or k has to be greater than kc. And since that's the condition for a cutoff, that's why we call this KC term the cutoff wave number. And we need this to be positive to be a guided mode. So we have an expression for KC was m pi over d, where m is allowed to be zero now. And so we can take this now and solve for cutoff frequency. And long story short, we have the exact same expression we had for the cutoff frequencies for the TE modes. This is really good because we can just use the one equation and calculate cutoff frequencies for both TE and TM at the same time. Let's think about the characteristic impedance. Characteristic impedance is defined as the amplitude of E over the amplitude of H. And we now have expressions for the electric and magnetic fields that we can plug in here to get an expression for the characteristic impedance. And since we've done the wave analysis here, we also have an expression for our phase constant. So we can actually calculate the characteristic impedance of our TM modes. Here's a visualization of the TM0 mode, which by the way is the TEM mode. It has a perfectly uniform field from plate to plate. The electric field's pointing straight from one plate to the other, not in an angle or anything. And the magnetic field is in the X direction. We can look at the TM1 mode. Now let's look at this a little bit more carefully. When we looked at the TE modes, I said we could interpret that subscript as the number of bright spots that we would see between the plates, or the number of peaks of the field. Now, if we look at this, it seems like we see two peaks, even though this subscript is one, because we see a peak up here, then it goes to zero, then another peak. And really what we're looking at is half of a peak at the top and half of a peak at the bottom. So really, overall, it is just one peak, and that's tricky and, and all that, but in fact, we still only have one bright spot. It's just been split to the top and the bottom. So keep that in mind that your, your bright spot could be split. The TE2 mode. Now the fact that the top and the bottom are splits a little bit more apparent because we can look at the width of a full bright spot and clearly what's at the top and the bottom is just each half of a bright spot. So overall, we have two bright spots, and that's the TM2 mode. Let's do an example, very similar to what we did before. Now we have a width of 2.48 millimeters. Remember, this was our design to make this 50 ohms. So 2.48 has a plate separation of 0.5 millimeters. Dielectric constant is still 2.3. 
Now I'm going to ask the question, what is the bandwidth of this waveguide when it is used as a transmission line? So when I say when it is being used as a transmission line, that means we only want the TEM mode. We don't want the TM1, 2, 3, or any of those higher order modes. We only want the TEM mode. Or if I'm talking now just in terms of TETM, it's the TM0 mode. And so we don't usually ever want a multi-moded transmission line. So we can calculate the bandwidth by finding the cutoff of this next higher order mode. So the T and TM modes have the same equation, so we can check them at the same time. That's super convenient. So let's calculate the TE1 and TM1 mode. And we plug in M equals one in our cutoff frequency equation. And we have all the numbers. We have speed of light. We have our mode number, plate separation, relative permeability, relative permittivity, and we end up calculating a cutoff frequency for the TE1 and TM1 modes of almost 200 gigahertz. That means this parallel plate transmission line we designed will act like a transmission line and only support the TEM up to 200 gigahertz, or 197.6 to be exact. Above that, the TEM still exists. It's just that now that there's other modes that also exist, we could accidentally be exciting them and bad things could happen. So the bandwidth of this guide is 197.6 gigahertz. Here's a summary of our analysis. We have our field solution. So this is what the fields look like for the TM modes. We have our phase constant. Same equations as for TE. The only real difference here is that M is allowed to be zero for the TM modes. It wasn't for the TE modes. And that's, of course, the TEM mode when we set M equal to zero. Cutoff frequency has the same equations for TE. And we have an expression for the characteristic impedance of the TM modes. So the TM zero mode is the TEM mode. Conclusion. Here is a big, ugly summary of all the different equations for these various different parameters that we might want to do waveguide analysis, wave designs. Um, not a whole lot really to discuss here. It's just a summary of a bunch of equations, the field values, the different waveguide parameters, if you want them. I plotted um, the first three order modes. We have equations for the TE0 mode. We know that it's not a physical mode. I went ahead and plotted them and then x them out to remind us those don't actually exist. Our TM0 mode, notice everything is straight and uniform. That is clearly the TEM. And here's plots of the other modes. And it's a little bit more obvious here how we are looking at two half bright spots. Um, so there's our modes. Final notes. So the parallel plate supports a TEM mode when it has a homogeneous dielectric between the plates. It also supports TE and TM modes. Very rare that we would actually use or even talk about the TE and TM modes of a transmission line because we almost always don't want those higher order modes. We found that the lowest order mode is the TM0 mode because that's the TEM mode. Uh, from there, the TE and TMs all have the same cutoff frequencies.